Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Prague. I'm sure you've been here already a few days. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you to CEPA or SEP, I'm not sure how they pronounce uh, themselves, for inviting me to speak to you today, which is an enormous privilege. Um, and apologies if you're not in my office. Um, I'm afraid that even though Baker Tilly is the eighth largest accounting and auditing network in the world, as far as Prague is concerned, we have no longer, we used to have, a seminar room that will accommodate 30 people, 30 plus people. Um, because of the downturn and the need for everybody to save money, um, we had to do away with that luxury. So we're, we turned it into a normal room for employees and moved out of one of the offices and, and rationalised it a little bit. So now we're in, the, in a situation where we don't have a, a meeting room to, to accommodate all of you at our place. Otherwise, I would have loved to have you at our offices. Um, it reminds me a little bit of when I was starting out in Poland about 21 years ago, uh, when I understood that a Chinese gentleman was going to come and see me, and that he was going to bring an interpreter, he spoke some English, but he'd have somebody with him. And we had at that time an eight-person meeting room, rather like I have in Prague now. Well, people started to turn up about half an hour beforehand, and most of them didn't speak any English, and there was me just trying with faulting, faltering Mandarin to try and say, you know, ting tzu, ting tzu, and you know, sit down and, and uh, cha, uh, what have you. And, 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 you know, it was very, very difficult and embarrassing. And this, the guy that's actually supposed to be the, the person I was meeting didn't turn up until already there was 14 other people there in an eight-man meeting. So everybody else in the office, because it was just at the start, we only had a, a small team, was sitting on their desks working in different rooms. And we, we were 14, we're t sitting too deep, the two people deep around the table in this tiny meeting room in the middle of a Polish summer with no air conditioning. So that was uh, really quite amusing. And what was even more amusing after that was when the guy had finally turned up and he asked me a question. Can, can he get um, investment reliefs on a, a building? Because he's heard about being able to get investment reliefs on a building. Uh, if, if he invests over a million euro. And I said, sure, you can do that. We can do that for you. And he said, well, that's fine because the building's already finished. I thought, okay, so tell me why I'm going to be able to get the government to give you an incentive to invest money when you've already put it here and can't get it back out again. And of course, uh, that was rather a large, uh, rather difficult thing. I had to be very diplomatic about it because, as you know, in China they have um, a lot of, they said a lot of store by face. Yeah, the, the, this mian uh, zi, as they call it, the face. You, you mustn't lose face in front of people, so it was very difficult, you know, and so, you know, I had to be very diplomatic about it and sort of like bow bravely and say, well, unfortunately, it may be more difficult, it's, it's, it's something more difficult, and you put your head slightly to one side and go, it's a little bit more difficult in those circumstances, in order to not say no to somebody in front of 14 people cramped around a meeting room door. That, that's just an example of how you have to be a little bit culturally aware. But let me just, at the moment, start off by drawing you a, an image on here. Can everybody see this? Yes. It's, it's frightfully deep. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over. By all means, make a note of this. My details here, djames at bakertilly.pl. There's my phone number. There's my name again. If ever you need an accountant, auditor, tax advisor, lawyer, payroll clerk, anything anywhere in the world, call me. I've got networks. Link to me on LinkedIn. Link to me on Facebook. It's good. Okay. Right, what's this? Anybody know what that is yet? A world. It might be well be a world for some small insects that live on it. Tomato. Tomato. You beat me to it. You say tomato. <laughs> Yeah. I say tomato, and not only is there the difference between tomato and tomato when it comes to whether people can get on with each other. I mean, in the song by, by George and Ira Gershwin, you have the two people, you know, basically realizing they're fighting over things which are not, not particularly important. Uh, you know, in American English, to now, you know, you, you sometimes hear the phrase tomato, tomato. Yes, yeah? so, so, so we're, we're arguing over things which are pointless. But the point is really that even over little things like that, 
people can actually get between themselves awfully frustrated. When it comes to England, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just whether a person says tomato with a long sort of like A or tomato with like an R, yeah, because we all say tomato in England. But some people go tomato and some people go tomato. Yeah? <laughs> Can I have tomato? <laughs> tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow. That's right, it always sounds like tomorrow, doesn't it? But uh, when tomorrow comes, they'll be probably pronouncing some, some, some different way still. But, um, and, and, in, and in England, whether you can actually get a job or not in a certain place or be a member of a certain golf club might well depend on whether you can say tomato or you say tomato. Yeah, so it, 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 England is a very, well it's not a classy society, it's a class-based society unfortunately. And the way you speak can actually determine whether you win jobs or lose jobs. Um, if, and, and most English people in business, uh, or British people in business, have developed a kind of neutral voice. So that when um, those, of, those who can, not everybody's able to do it, but those who can, have developed a kind of neutral voice uh, where they answer the phone in a kind of very neutral RP English, the one that I try to talk in most of the time, which is not too posh and not too, and not too um, non-posh. And then they're listening for what the voice at the other end will say, especially if they're the one trying to sell to the other person rather than being the buyer, and the buyer can talk how the hell they like, but the seller wants to be culturally and aware of what, what the buyer might want. And in England, that's all to do with class. And not all to do with class, but a, a larger amount to do with class. And in a, a, a more class-free or aspiring to be a class-free society, I don't think the United States is by any means a class-free society, but aspires to be a class-free society. It wouldn't want to say, hey, we're a very classy, class-based society and we're proud of it. Quite the opposite. America aims to be a class-free society um, and prides itself on, 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 on attempts to be a class-free society. So, so, so in, in England, if you're listening, you know, you listen to what the, the guy on the other end of the phone sounds like, and you adjust your, your own accent up or down a notch, if you can, those who can, depending on what you hear. Now, that's, that's necessary in England. It's necessary in one or two other countries, but in the main, many, many countries, you wouldn't need to do that at all. But basically, a word tomato shows you, or even of it, even in itself, the importance of language in culture. I don't want to talk an awful lot about that, but because I did this in a, in a previous lecture, which later on, if you're interested, I can link you to. This is another culture lecture, which was perhaps a little bit more simple than the one I want to give to you today. I, I see more mature students here today. I'd like to actually. I also did some research on your university, and, and I, I, I know that I can stretch you guys more than I did the last lot. So that's why this, this isn't going to be a repetition of the one that I did before, but if anybody's interested, then, then, then I, I can send you links to, to the one that I did before, which has a lot of the jokey stuff about how different words mean different things in different languages, and how the Swedish couldn't understand why, why the English were laughing when they put up a, um, you know, a Hoover advert for their Hoover. Nothing sucks like Electrolux and things like that. You know, that, there was a lot of that in the other lecture. I don't, it's, it's all fun and what have you. But I don't want to get too much into that. A little bit more serious, I think. Um, but um, but what I what I do want to say on language is, language is clearly a, a, an area where culture is going to going to come off. Um, gonna, it's going to affect culture a lot. Is, is the language and how it works? But it's also a two-way street between language and culture. I mean, for example, we have the word tomato or tomato in the English language, but anybody know where it comes from? Latin. Sorry? Latin. Latin's not true, although I like, I like the idea of that. It comes from Latin America, I'll give you that much, <laughs> um, because that's where they came from originally, although they were more like cherry tomatoes. I must have one day somebody gave me, uh, someone that, on, the, um, on, on a menu, that, that, you know, there was some salad with cherry tomatoes. I thought, well, that's interesting. It'd be interesting to, to, to um, to try a tomato that tastes like a cherry, you know, 
And when they brought me these, this salad with cherry tomatoes, does anybody have cherry? Do you have some cherry yes. tomatoes? When they brought me the salad with the cherry tomatoes, I wanted to throw it back at them because they tasted like tomatoes. They didn't taste like cherries at all. I said, wait, oh, wait, what's this? You told me these were cherry tomatoes. I said, no, they look like cherries. I said, are you sick? <laughs> well, I wasn't quite that good, actually. But I probably wanted to say it, but I was probably a bit more diplomatic. I said, they, they, they don't look like cherries, my friend. Cherries look different to this. These look like tomatoes. And he, and he said, well, no tomatoes are much bigger than this. I said, uh-uh. You're talking about certain cultivars first made in Ohio in the United States of America. About a century or two after, tomatoes were first eaten by people. Yeah? They only got that big in the United States of America. The initial, in fact, I'm not even sure it was the United States by then, but Ohio anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the original tomato looks like what you've just called me, told me would be a cherry. So I'm not happy, and I'm not giving you a tip. <laughs> but it was a good way of saving money anyway. But, um, so, <laughs> so basically, um, uh, the, the word tomato actually comes from um, a Nahuatl language word, and as in Nahuatl, everything ends in TL, like axolotl. I don't know if you know an axolotl, this kind of like neat thing, some people keep it as a, as a pet. Everything ends in tall in, in, in Nahuatl. So the original word for a tomato was actually tomato, yeah? And we took that word from, from via Spanish. The Spanish took it from there because the Spanish were the ones mucking about down there rather than the English who mucked about further north. Um, and uh, so the, the Spanish took this and started to say, hey, this is good, we can't quite like this, doesn't taste much of cherries, but we do like it. And, and they started to, to bring it all around the world and they, 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 they introduced it to the to the Anglo world as well, if you like, the Anglosphere, as it's sometimes called. And everybody started eating them. Some of them called them tomatoes, some of them called them tomatoes, but the Mexicans still called them tomato. Yeah? But the fact that we have this borrowing from Mexican via Spanish is an example of what Henry Hitchens, Henry Hitchin? Not Henry Higgins, he was from My Fair Lady. Uh, Henry Hitchings calls a, a borrowing is a, is, a, is a witness to one culture rubbing up against another culture. So whenever you borrow words from another, from another language, it's because your culture has abraded in some way against that other culture. Otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to borrow the word. Yeah? If, you, if you have the thing that's there, um, you know, you wouldn't, uh, if it was something that you weren't surprised by in some way and, 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 uh, and found new and which caused you a small amount of shock, you would simply make up your own word for it, yeah? Making up words is actually quite hard for human beings. Well, I'm, I'm talking about making words up completely randomly. If you look at your language, there's any language, even those of you in the room that, that know a lot of other languages, you can, you can look at the, the, whichever language it is, and the words, well, for example, in English, you'll see a lot of them are spelt in, the way, in a way different to, 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 to their, the way they're pronounced. Yeah? We, uh, I know that the Americans have gone a long way to, to put this problem right. You have words like light and tonight in American English, which is it's got I-T-E on the end, rather than rather than I-G-H-T, but then the, the question is really, why is it I-T-E and not go the whole way and actually have it phonetically A-I-T, which is a bit more phonetic than I-T, yeah, because somebody from this part of the world would look at tonight spelt the so-called easy way and say, well, that looks like tonite, yeah? So, so it, but, but, but nevertheless, the old spellings that we have, so that tonight looks like tonicht, yeah, tell us about the fact that that word comes from an old Anglo-Saxon expression and that the word for tonight in older English, or at least the word for night, would have been nicht, yeah? And not night at all. So, the, the, the history of language shows us, or, the, or linguistics shows us, philology shows us, that words almost always come from 
either an older version in your own language, or they're a borrowing from another word in another language, or there's something called a calc, C-A-L-Q-U-E, which basically is something like um, you take an expression in another language and you translate it into your own language using the instruments available in your language, but the idea is still, the phrase still is something taken from a different language. So it's not a direct borrowing of a word, it sounds like your language, but it came from a different language in terms of the expression. And almost every word that we have has some kind of etymology, some kind of origin that you can study. There are some that we're not too clear about. Quiz, for example, is one that people are not too clear about. But even company names, they have, you, you know, it's very difficult to find somebody, invent a name for a company that isn't either their own name, the name of the founder. Devry University had an interesting history, you probably know the history of your own of your own university. It started off as being somebody else, De Forest, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was, it was, it was a, in the early days, De Vries University in Tel Aviv. Uh, I've been actually doing this. It was first of all called De Forest because De Vries was the real founder, but he thought, well, you know, naming it after myself is a bit much. I don't want to be immodest here. So he's my chum, yeah, De Forest. I'll name it after him, yeah. So after he died. De Forest said, you know, I want it renamed after De Vries. So it was like a kind of mutual admiration society between those two guys. But fair enough, the guy had enough modesty to not name it after himself at the beginning. So at first, it was, you can look it up on Wikipedia if you don't believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's an example of an institution named after the founder. Okay. Um, others, for example, these days, you've got lots and lots and lots of things going on on the internet. There's about two billion web pages, probably one for every person who actually even goes on the internet in the, on, in the world. And that, that's not the number of pages, probably rather fewer um, sites with, with, with individual names, but they've all got to think of names for themselves. And, when, and if you now go and try and get anything.com, you're going to have your work cut out. So, so in order to get something meaningful, people have to go for longer and longer and longer names.com. And of course, it becomes very difficult because then when you send anybody an email, it gets very boring because you have to type you know, about 15 letters and it's not very cool, really. So people start to bring in um, things like hyphens or not hyphens. They bring in, in numbers instead of letters, but then it gets very confusing. Um, the fact is, we've probably got too few words for the number of individual things that people want to do creatively with language and names, proper names, now around the world. And glo the globalization of, of thinking, especially in the internet, is putting pressure on the, on the words that there are. So in the end what's happening is you're getting more and di more different endings. So you've got country code endings, and then you've got other things coming up like .biz, .mobi and what have you, just so that people can get enough internet space. For, their, for the word that they want to use to name their website. But if you take these really popular ones, even with those, you can almost always think, well, it's, it tells me something. The name of this, of this site tells me something. Like, for example, Facebook. Yeah? It tells me, it's, a, it's like a book of faces. Yeah? I mean, some people do put other parts of their anatomy on other than their face, but they usually get taken down quite quickly. Um, and, um, and, and for example, Google. That might sound to you as though it's a, as though it's a, a complete, you know, thought of from, from thin air. But when you think about it, it's actually go ogle. Yeah? Go and have a look at something. A great term for a search engine. And even if people think, this is a funny thing, even when people think they've grabbed something completely original, then a linguist can say, well, actually, that's not entirely original. It's not entirely completely original. Completely original language would be something like... <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> you just tried writing that. Yeah. 
Mars. So, so, um, so, so that's you know that. Uh, so you have to come up with something based on the the instruments, the the, the the phonemic representations that you've got already in a language, especially English language, and the, uh, the, the meanings intrinsic in words. Now, I don't know if you know this company, um, I see some cameras around, so I know that you, you've all heard of the, the company that's, that's filed now, very unfortunate really, for Section 11 bankruptcy, Kodak, yeah? Now, where do you think that name came from? A bear. A bear. That's what I thought as well. But in fact, that's that. It does suggest a bear. When I was young and I saw that for the first time, I thought, "Oh, great, Kodak. That's a bear." Yeah. But in fact, the problem is that it's a Kodiak bear, which which I I only discovered that afterwards. I was really disappointed because I, I was really impressed when I, saw, I thought, "Well, that means that, that Kodak that doesn't mean a bear after all." I was really actually quite upset by it. But um, the Kodak actually, um, was it the name, do you think that was the name of the person that founded Kodak? Mm, maybe, yes. Mm -mm. Well, I'll put you out of your misery on that one, because it wasn't. Kodak was founded by Mr. Who? Anybody know? Eastman. Eastman, well done. Um, so, and Mr. Eastman thought of the name Kodak, and he was one of the few people, he was one of the few exceptions that proved the rule. <coughs> that normally people don't think of a random word for a product. They usually think of something, you know, like, that would be like a, a, you know, like clip or something. Something onomatopoeic maybe, something which, where the, where the meaning of it is memorable but is a clue to what's going on. Well, Kodak actually, is, it's a nice word, but it is actually one of the few totally random coinages. Um, Mr. Eastman was obviously a visionary and willing to actually go the extra mile, but most people wouldn't do that because they feel stupid about it. Actually putting out a word that, you know, people would be going, what's that supposed to mean? You know, whereas, uh, where does that word come from? And, and people do this unconsciously. People actually get very self-conscious about saying, well, I'm going to call my, my, my product and then come up with something completely random. Yeah, because people, people are worried, this is going to sound a bit silly and people are not going to take it seriously. And, well, I don't feel like comfortable with that, and that's how it's a language as well. So almost everything that you see around you, and everything you use, and everything you do, has an etymology. Now, English has borrowings from 350 odd languages. So therefore, our language has more cultural openness than almost, well, than for certain any other language on the world. Americans and British people can take pride in the fact that they have something approaching the default world culture in as much as there is one. Okay, so if you go to international gatherings and you behave, you speak, and you speak in American English, and you behave like an educated American, you're going to be the norm. If you go to somewhere like, you know, if you go, if you turn up in Geneva and go to a meeting with the World Health Organization, and you behave like a normal educated American, you're going to be pretty near the norm, and you'll find that there's more people trying to act like you, than you have to try and adjust to act like them. And that gives us a certain sense of, well, that's fine, that means everything we do is okay. It isn't. And it's possible to give a lot of offence um, and to cause a lot of discomfort to yourself, especially when you're in a, in a situation where in the future you might have got your business degree, you might be sent out to other places, parts around the world, and you might find that people react to you in a very disappointing way that you don't understand. Yeah? And that's why, even though we're in an advantage that we've got, we're actually much more, in fact, we're almost the vehicle, English language is almost the vehicle, whereby the rest of the world understands each other. So when the Chinese now go and invest in Africa, they're not trying to make the Africans learn Mandarin. They know it's going to be a bit much, you know, the lead time would be too big. They've got Africa, large numbers of Africans with an awareness of English, they simply go, they talk to them in English. 
So other parts of the world trying to understand each other's cultures often use English as the vehicle. That's why we're becoming almost like a, a default international culture. But for you to rely on that, if you in the future end up with a job where you're going to go around the world and go to different factories or different offices in different countries and try and make people do what you would like them to do as managers, <coughs> and you want to rely on the fact that you've got a, the American culture, you might find that it causes you some pain. Okay? And that's why we're going to have a discussion today. We've got not a lot of time, in fact, just to, to go through a few things. Um, but hopefully it will get you thinking and set you off on a certain journey. What I'm going to say over the next hour and a half now I've still got left. Now, the word culture itself, where does that come from? At some point, Latin is going to be one of the answers. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's the answer right now. So you, yeah, it's a very timely response. It is indeed from Latin. Anybody have an idea what um, it means in Latin? What culture means? What cultura means in Latin? What it, what it actually means? It means cultivation. Yeah. So cultura just meant cultivation. Yeah. Um, which means, of course, caring for something so that it grows. Is that a, a culture became, uh, a, a, or we're talking about the cultivation, a person showing their own cultivation, their own upbringing, if you like, their own class. And some people, when you talk about culture to some people, they think you're talking about the opera. Um, you say, oh, I'm, I'm interested in culture. And people say, yeah, well, so am I. There's, some, there's something going on down at the museum. There's Salvador Dali being shown at the museum. Or Caravaggio's are coming from Malta to Moscow. And on the way back, they're going to Poland. Let's all go to the National Gallery and look at the Caravaggio's. That we, that otherwise, we'd have to go to Malta to see them. They think that the culture is about lovely paintings, novels and plays, um, opera, things like that. That's what some people understand by the, I mean, the, the term culture. I prefer to say this is what we call high culture, okay? And it's not the word, the meaning of the word culture, which I'm using in a business context, okay? So we need a different definition for the word culture. And has anybody, would anybody like to hazard, or has anybody know of a definition that would like to hazard for? for the word culture in the business context? I would say like socialization, like um, how you interact with other people. How you interact with other people's good? You were going to say something? Uh, working in the environment. Working in the environment. The environment is a, it's a good the, the word. Working in the environment is good. I'll give you a, I'll give you a definition of culture. Hopefully you can all, all see this. Collective mental programming, let me just get the exact wording. The collective mental programming of people in the environment, people in an environment, of the people, this is important, I don't want to miss Christmas spoken to me, of the people in an environment. Anybody got any idea of who said that? Um, I don't know about that, like who said that, but I just wanted to also add to it. Can it also refer to be the basic standards, um, values, or even goals that the company is aiming for? Well, it can, because that's all part of the collective mental program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, goals and goals and things like that become part of the culture because you become programmed, mentally programmed, in a collective basis to think that those goals are important and therefore they become part of the culture. But they, they ought not and they cannot be the whole of the culture because there, there's going to be other things that, that 
are acceptable in that company other than what's actually written down as a goal. They might be a very important feature in the culture, but they won't be all of the culture. The culture in an individual company might even come down to what a particular manager likes and doesn't like. I can tell you, in our company in Warsaw, which, which is bigger than in, which is much bigger than here, uh, we have a, we're over several floors, and there's a different culture on each floor. There's a different culture on each floor. There's flaws in our organisation where it's okay to listen to music while you work. Just because the manager believes that it will relax the person and enable them to work more efficiently. In my floor, I don't allow people to listen to music while they work. Okay? Um, so it's a different culture. I don't believe that it's possible to listen to music and do accountancy properly at the same time. And nobody's managed to persuade me so far that you can, and so therefore I banned it. Well, different people learn differently. They work well differently. Well, you may say that, but if a person's not using part of their brain to process the music, then why are they listening to it? But I want all their brain, because I'm a kind of exploitative person. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. I thought culture is generally the management system of the profession instead of the activities going on around the departments and the areas. Well, well, the culture is well, the culture in the way that in the way that this. I mean, what I'm using here is is the definition. Of, look, there's lots of ways in which people could define culture. Okay. <laughs> And it's possible to, to, that anybody could place a different definition for the purposes of a, an academic paper, what have you. But this comes from Gert Hofstede. Has anybody heard of Hofstede? I just Googled him. I Googled him. <laughs> have you? Yeah, just yeah. now. Okay. So this comes from Hofstede. You guys are going to be one step ahead of me all the way through the next <laughs> I must remind you how much roaming for data costs in this part. <laughs> Um, so, um, the collective mental program of, of the people in an environment is, is from Gert Hofstede, yeah? Uh, I can't say senior and I can't say junior, because there was actually three of them and he was the one in the middle, so there isn't, uh, the second. I don't know what you call that in American, because I know you like senior and junior. We can't the second. Second. Second, the second. Yeah, so Gert Hofstede, the second, except that he was a Dutchman, is a Dutchman, he's 83 now. Um, still alive, obviously looks after himself, and uh, his the reason why he became um, the well should I I don't think there's ever been like a, an official ranking of who the major um, the major person to have something to say about culture is in the world, but but Gert Hofstede is probably you know <coughs> recognised in academia as being a pretty big voice. So coming back to your question, whether whether this is a whether this is necessarily the only possible definition of culture, no, it's, it's not the only possible definition of culture, and you can define it differently for different purposes. Yeah, but for 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 most of what's written and read and the things which revolve around the things that that, that Hofstede came up with, it all comes down to to, to it being. This being the, the definition, so a collective mental program or the collective mental programming of the people in an environment. An environment is actually quite important because it's not just necessary corporations. Hofstede started off looking at cultural clashes between countries. Why did he do that? Because well, the first thing that happened to him is he went to Indonesia, which used to belong to Holland, and he went to Indonesia to you know, sort something out down there and was a bit surprised that they didn't want to do things necessarily the way that he thought they should be, even though it was supposed to be his colony, etc. They actually had a different culture. So it surprised him slightly. Then he got back to Holland again, and he had a big, 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 big accident. He fell in love. <laughs> but he fell in love with a woman from a different culture. She was English. Now, the, 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 some of the biggest, most successful companies in Europe, like Shell, are 
UK, Dutch entities. You probably know from the history of the United States that the English and the Dutch always got on, on very well together. So as far as two countries similar to each other are concerned, yeah, you would think that the UK or England and Holland were like brothers. And in, in, uh, on, a, on an international scale, I suppose we are. Um, you know, there wasn't any fighting between the Dutch and the English over who got what. It wasn't like the French had tried to cut us off, you know, between Louisiana and what have you, they tried to cut us off from getting too far west, from the early, you know, the earlier history of North America, um, where we had to fight the French in the end. And we didn't fight the Dutch over America, we just got on with them. So, you'd think, wouldn't you? I mean, there have been a few, a few small skirmishes in history between the British and the Dutch, but in the main, I mean, we even took part of our royal family from there at one point, the House of Orange. So we've been good friends with the Dutch. So you might be a little bit surprised that the thing that set off Hofstadter in a lifetime of researching international cultures was a romance with a woman from England which caused him great pain because of culture shock. When, the, when he was so close culturally anyway, on a worldwide scale, to England. Well, the English are a little bit funny, and the Dutch are also funny, but they're funny at different things. They laugh at different things. You know, the, probably the Dutch guy, Hofstede, he probably said a joke to um, to, to the, uh, um, the, the the girl's parents, and they probably said to him, "That's not amusing. Please kindly leave our house at once." But uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making that last bit up. But uh, but the, you, you do get into a situation where cultural clashes can happen. But well, you don't expect it, but, but what, 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 why Hofstede is important is, I mean, you can talk about culture, national cultures or organizational cultures, and, and, and talk about it anecdotally, you can talk about it anecdotally for hours and hours and hours. And if you want to see my film where I do talk about it anecdotally, then just, just go on, on YouTube and look up Uncle Davy's Culture Lecture that's in four parts. You'll see the one that I did last year, different to this one, because I believe I could push you guys harder. But if you want to see it, it's there. You just have to, you just have to, to find that one on YouTube, Uncle Davy's Culture Lecture. And um, basically, um, just rewind my mental tape a little bit. The reason why Hofstede is important is that he didn't just talk anecdotally about it. He brought in um, dimensions. Dimensions whereby you can actually measure to a degree objectively, because culture is very subjective by, by its very nature, but he tried to measure objectively along dimensions on a graph, on scales that you could actually measure yeah, aspects of culture. And he came up with six of them this isn't as easy as you think, or you might think. Because what you've got to do is you've got to find criteria whereby you can measure cultures in such a way that they don't overlap. Yeah? It's very easy to, to, to say, well, you know, um, here's, a, here's a, a dimension where I, you know, how much in a culture people trust one another. Yeah? And then later on, you, you look at another one and say, well, here's another one where how much criminality there is. And then what, what you, um, what you uh, may or may not find or realize at the time is that you've actually got two that one is possibly a derivative of the other. If there's high criminality, then it's likely that they won't trust each other so much because of the high criminality. And therefore, they're not completely independent characteristics. Whereas Hofstede came up with six dimensions of culture which are rather not derivative of each other, which is very interesting. And I wanted to, as the main body of what I wanted to bring to you today, is to look at them, because they apply not only to countries, they also can apply to corporations and organisations. They can even apply to families. I mean, remember, Hofstede talked about an environment, the people of an environment. And at the big scale, an environment is the world. Except for it's not helpful to talk about the whole world because we've got nothing to compare it to. 
you know, if, if we had uh, other worlds with humanoids on or, or other intelligent life, then we could say, well, let's compare Earth culture to these people's culture. Yeah? And, of course, on things like Star Trek, that's exactly the sort of, of thinking that you can sometimes see being, being um, played with. But on a big scale, you're comparing things like United States culture, which is what Hofstede, most people researching his dimensions, have looked at the United States culture versus, let's say, China. Yeah? So that's looking at big nation culture. Um, you could take Hofstede's dimensions and apply them within the United States, for example, just to different states. You can actually take all of your states and apply and map them all on each of, uh, or put them all on a scale from 1 to 120 on each of the six indices which Hofstede came up with. And run the questionnaires on a statistical sample of people, see how they, how they answer the questions and come up with the scale of where, where different states in America are and you'll see differences. And then if you did the same thing within towns, you'd find that within a state, you'd probably find smaller differences of culture. And then you might find if you go uptown within a certain town, you're going to get a difference in culture which is bigger than, the, than, than even the one that you thought you had when you answered the questionnaire statewide. And within states, you might have more differences in culture within a single state than you thought you had when you got the answers to the questionnaire over the whole over the whole of the, the country. That's the funny thing. And then you go and say, okay, well, within this particular area, what's the culture in, in this street? There's various, there's various organizations that have got their offices in this business park. Do they have a common culture at all? Well, the, the, the more you actually focus up on it, the more you'll find that this organization has a culture radically different to that organization, based just solely on the six main um, dimensions, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. And also, uh, when we're talking about organizations, there are additional dimensions that you can bring in to talk, to talk about organizations like companies um, or government offices, which you wouldn't necessarily be interested in talking about the culture of a whole nation. So let me talk about the, the, these uh, dimensions of, um, of culture for, I'll take you through them one at a time, the first one is called power distance. Power, the power distance index means to what extent do people in the given culture, in the given environment, accept that decision making is done by only an elite or one individual, to which extent do they, do they accept the fact that some people have more say than others? Yeah? And on a scale of 1 to 120, on the, in the first case you can have a look and see what kind of countries um, are willing to accept um, that, um, that, that some individuals are able to have more, much more power than others. Well, you can see immediately implications for politics in there. You think that national cultures that would, would say that we all should have pretty much the same say, they're much more likely to be fighting for democracy and achieving democracy, whereas people that think that well, it's natural for some people to have a bigger say and others to simply knuckle under and do what they want. Those are countries which you might think would be more difficult to, to, to understand that, or to put a value on, on democracy, and therefore you might expect those, those countries to be more um, places where, 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 where it would be hard to find democracies having developed, where you'd perhaps be more likely to find dictatorships. Um, just give you a couple of examples. For the power uh, distance index, it was very high for Latin American countries and very high also in a lot of Asian countries. The lowest of them all was Austria with only 11 and 
Denmark was the second lowest with 18. Um, Israel, sorry, Austria had 18 doors on the second lowest, Israel second lowest with 13, um, which is interesting. Um, the United States, well, I won't say the United States yet, I'll give you a couple more. Sweden, 31, um, Romania, 90, Spain, 57, Britain, the United Kingdom, 35. What do you think the United States, what do you think the United States had on that scale? Sorry? 40. You know a lot. Was that a guess? Or did you have you read Hofstede? Okay. Well, you're right. You're absolutely bang on. That's very good of cultural <laughs> sensitivity, I think, uh, you must have. Um, yes, it's exactly right. The United States um, has uh, 40 on the scale. So uh, it's not massively democratic or not, ma not massively... Um, um, Intolerant of some people having to say more than others. Yes. What's the scale out of, and what does the higher mean that they're less likely to accept that other people have authority? If if you if you if on this particular one, if you're up in the high ones, like ninety was I think about about the high ninety five was Guatemala and they came on the worst. Yeah. Um, if you, that means that you are willing to accept in your national culture that you yourself don't have anything to say, in, um, you simply obey orders, or that some people don't have anything to say in that they're there to obey orders, and some people are there to tell them what to do. So it's the sort of new world order dream, if you like, of, uh, of some people, you know, being like, you know, in, in what is it? Oh, brave new world. H.G. Wells' this time machine where you've got the Morlocks and the, the Elwood. You know, some, some, people, uh, some people seem to think some, you know, if you've got a high score, um, a person that would, up, would accept the Morlocks and Elwood world of, of, of the time machine by H.G. Wells, they'd be at the top of the scale, they'd be like 120. Whereas a person that wouldn't be happy and would fight all their life until, they had an, until everybody had an equal say, not only them having um, an equal say, but making sure that others in the room also had an equal say, there'd be the theoretical zero, I suppose. So you're on a scale from zero to 120. So is this maybe if the number is higher, more the society is dictator? Yes, somehow? the people are more. The, so if the number is high, then if, if your if your if your aim in life were to be, let's say, a dictator like like um, Sacha Baron Cohen. Um, <laughs> then, I don't know if anybody's seen that yet. It's the latest film by Borat. Yes. Um, um, if, if your aim in life, or if your your goal in life was to be a dictator, then and you were shopping, you were like country shopping for where shall I go and live and become this dictator? You would be looking for high values on that index. Yeah. So that's the first of the, of the six. So power, power distance. Okay. The second. And this is not derivative, although some people might think it was slightly derivative, is individualism. The reason why it's not derivative from power distance is that you can allow a person a certain amount of individualism without allowing them any say. So it's not truly derivative. Yeah? Obviously, if you have a dictatorship, it tends to go more towards collectivism than individualism. But, um, but the two are not. They're related, but they're not really derivative because um, it's really a question of how much value you put on a person being themselves. Yeah? Some people say to managers, don't worry as you go around the world. Yeah? Let's imagine, I'm speaking to you today knowing that you're learning, that you're doing a graduate program in, in business. Okay? So therefore, it's fair to assume And in international business, and you're interested in international culture. Therefore, it's fair to assume that some of you in the future, or maybe some of you already have been, um, will be going around the world doing things like maybe controlling, maybe internal audit, or something like that, or just checking out, or, or just going to, to, to find out, uh, setting up a branch office or something somewhere, managing something. And you get advised, well, 
At the end of the day, yes, if you go to Arabia, do remember not to show somebody the sole of your foot. Don't cluck glass them with your left hand because that's used for going to the toilet. And, and, um, and you know, be sensitive. Don't mess with the prophet's name and things like that. Show respect to their religion. And, um, and always say peace be upon him if you, say, if you, if you mention Muhammad. And um, you know, be sensitive to the, to the religion. Um, uh, don't go flaunting uh, food around during Ramadan until after until after it's, the sun has gone down. And I'll give you a bunch of hints, which and there's, a, there's a set bunch of hints for every single country. And there's nice films on YouTube that will show you these for almost every country. You know, like don't blow your nose at table in Japan, things like that. You know, there's all, it's, it's easy to find them. You know, just look up cultural do's and don'ts for different parts of the world, and you'll get them. What they tend to end up with is, but in the end, um, be yourself. Yeah? Well, being yourself is a good advice in those countries where individualism, uh, the individual index, individuality index, is high. It's individualism versus, all of this is, is, is versus something. For example, power distance is power distance versus equality. Individualism is individualism versus collectivism. Yeah? Now if you're in a collectivist society where, where the default culture is very collectivist, then be yourself. Obviously you have to, you're not going to stop being yourself. But projecting your own mental fingerprint around the place isn't going to make you very popular. Okay? So even if you're just traveling to a place or going to a place just to just achieve something in business, maybe you're going somewhere to meet a seller or a buyer, uh, and, and you go to a place which is very collectivist, these are places where if you are a bit of an eccentric, you might want to turn it down a little bit. Because it's not welcome so much. It's not that people don't like it. Everybody, I mean, th these are only relative things, yeah? It's not that in the countries with a high degree of collectivism that people aren't individuals, of course they are, they're still individuals, yeah? It's just they don't foist their individuality out on other people so much. Okay, they've still all got an, a, a perfectly individual fingerprint on their hands, and they've got an individual fingerprint inside their heads. Everybody. The question is, in an individualist environment, it's perfectly acceptable to come in, you know, to work with a, a, a like one of my old bosses used to come in to work with a Bugs Bunny tie, yeah? In an individualist corporation, that sort of thing would be welcomed. In a more collectivist organization, you come in with a Bugs Bunny tie and you'll find you're, you know, frowned upon and maybe, you know, if you're not at an equivalent level, you come in with a Bugs Bunny tie, you might get called into the HR office and Cat Burt, I don't know if you ever read the Scott Adams books or whoever it is being HR um, director in your company, has got to warn you that if you come in with ties like that, you can't expect to have a very interesting career path. In fact, you might even be fired for not, for not keeping to the dress code. And so organisations with high collectivism do things like dress codes. Um, and as you remember China, Maoist China, used to have, well, everybody wore the same kind of tuning, didn't they? And factories were, were pumping it out, you know, hundreds of millions of these things at a time. And people used to just wear these standard Chinese tunics. And they still, that's basically the way people dress around in Korea, in North Korea, of course. I don't refer to South Korea. Yes? Um, speaking of collectivism and individualism, what kind of company do you consider your city or display? I think we're an individual. We're in an individualistic company because when we're talking, if you're talking about professionals, a lot of individualism is required. Especially if you talk about lawyers. Um, and my our company is actually owned by an English lawyer. So, um, um, and English English people, the UK is highly individualistic, as indeed is America, um, on a worldwide scale, and. Lawyers, as a profession, because they have to be able to marshal an argument and persuade others to their point of view. 
If you can't do that, forget being a Tony. Yeah? Therefore, they are individualists. It's hard to make a legal firm look like a, a very... Uh, you can put things like dress codes on them, but they're still going to have very much... They're still going to be big individuals, and that's what they have to be. <coughs> lawyers have to be individualists. Well, they're going to be very good lawyers, certainly not in the, the legal system that we have. So, um, basically, because of, of, of that kind of leading from the top, individualism in our firm is highly welcome, which is how come my boss could get away with his Bugs Bunny tie. Um, but there are companies um, where, you know, simply everybody's supposed to be the same. You don't turn up at McDonald's looking different to, you know, your average McDonald's employee. You don't show a lot of individuality, you know. If you work for, for Disney World, you know, they give you a script that you have to say to people, you know. Um, you've, got to, you've got to look, you've got to put on a, um, a Mickey Mouse costume, yeah? And you've got to go and you've got to wave to children a certain way and hand them things and say certain things to them, yeah? I mean, you, you can't, um, you, you, you know, you can't be your own Mickey Mouse. Yeah? You can't say, well, you know, I'm going to be, today I'm going to be, um, a, 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 a angst-ridden um, Mickey Mouse is going to go around to his, uh, going to children, going to them. <laughs> Young man, do you prefer Schopenhauer or Kierkegaard? Yeah, this just won't, it won't wash. Yeah, so there are certain companies where where individualism isn't that fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so on the on a, on, a, on a scale of uh, let's watch the time. Um, on a scale of from one to 120, the, the highest individualistic countries are given, you know, the um, high, high, higher rates, that's for, for high individualism, more collectivist countries are, are, are lower. So Hungary and Canada both got 80 on that scale. Colombia was right at the bottom, no sorry, Guatemala was even, even further down the bottom again. Which just goes to show there is a bit of a correlation between these two, because Guatemala had 95% for power, for power distance. And Guatemala comes in at the bottom with only six for individualism versus collectivism. You might think that China uh, was uh, uh, the, 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 the most difficult for, for, for that, but in fact, um, not apparently the case. Um, China comes in uh, uh, for, with some other other thing right at the top, uh, but uh, not on lack of individualism. I don't th this is something different in this case. So the, the lowest individualism is, is things like Colombia, Indonesia has four, Guatemala has six. Anybody got an idea of what the United States has? Nine. It has ninety-one. <laughs> So, uh, individualism is highly regarded. Um, strange enough, I mean, a lot of this goes with, with religions. Yeah? Um, the, the countries which are Roman Catholic and the countries which are atheist both tend to have a higher degree of collectivism. The countries which are Protestant tend to have a high degree, and also, strangely, the countries which are Islamic, which you might find strange, have a high degree of individualism. Yeah? Well, maybe there's a, maybe there's a correlation, maybe there isn't a correlation, because even, even if you take one single, if, even if you take a denomination, if we, if, we bring, if we want to bring it into religion, even if you take one denomination, and pick a denomination, you want me to pick Judaism, Christianity, whatever you want to pick. Just to be fair, I'll do two. I'll do Judaism. If you take, uh, and I'll do some, Christ and I'll do some Christianity. If you take, um, if you take Judaism, yeah. Um, if you look at the amount of in individualism that you're allowed in a progressive synagogue, well, it's all about individualism. It's massively individualistic, yeah. Whereas in a, in a conservative uh, orthodox, where everybody's dressing the same, especially in the world, where you would have like um, Hasidim, they're all dressing the same, that's not a very individualistic environment. 
So even within Judaism, from progressive being a tendency to be a higher degree of individualism in the culture, to the orthodox with a much lower degree of, of individualism, so even within a single religion, you've got a large dichotomy. I bet that you probably would find individual synagogues in a place where there's a rather large mix of people with different cultures going on, and a bit of a clash between people within the synagogue that would prefer more individualism and, and, and other people within the synagogue that would prefer more collectivism. And you certainly will find that in Protestant churches. If uh, those of you who go to, to, to churches or, or are members of churches, you may find that these cultural clashes happen even within, within a single church. You get certain in, in members of the congregation that want us all to be the same, and there are others that want to be a bit more individualistic. So, you know, it's not that you can ever say with these dimensions, well, Guatemala is got a high power distance index and a low individualistic index. Therefore, if I meet a Guatemalan, I should expect that person to be open to all sorts of fascism and have very little individualism. That's, that, no, remember, I, the, <laughs> you say what? Then you say what because you never heard the beginning of the sentence. Yeah? I said, just because a Guatemalan at the beginning, and you're right to say what if you didn't hear the beginning of the sentence, but the reason why you were the only one saying what is because everybody heard the beginning of the sentence, sorry. But, um, <laughs> but uh, otherwise they'd have all been saying what, hopefully. Um, uh, I said, let me rewind it back, just because a Guatemalan, mm -hmm. okay, just because Guatemala, pardon me, just because Guatemala as a country, yeah, has a high power distance index and a lower individualism or the lowest individual index does not mean that if you meet a Guatemalan you should expect somebody okay who who is ready to, to follow a El Duce and has very little individuality because that's called prejudice yeah if you take these things these things are based on averages over a population but within that population you get all sorts of extremes all sorts of different individual fingerprints. So you have to teach, teach you, have, you must treat people as individuals and not make assumptions as that they think this or think that. But you at the same time you've got to expect that because there is such a thing as collective mental programming, you've got to be ready for the culture of that area, yeah, to be different. That doesn't mean to say everybody's happy with it. People are not necessarily happy with the culture of the place where they're in. They just get used to it. We'll talk a little bit more about the faces of getting used to different cultures. But there's a lot of people absolutely unhappy with the culture that they're in. If I talk about Obama, or talk about George Bush, he was, both of them in their times, have been elected presidents of your wonderful country, and both of them in their times have had nearly half of the country absolutely disliking what they were doing. So it doesn't mean to say just because, you know, the whole of America was voting for George Bush so that he got elected. It doesn't mean to say that everybody voted for him. And just because um, you know, the average or the average respondent in the Guatemalan questionnaire puts them right up on power distance and right down on individualism, it doesn't mean you're going to find that every Guatemalan you meet will fit that model. It just means that's the culture that's emerged within that country. Don't expect every individual to, to be happy with the culture. Still, you have to fit with the culture. They have to fit with it, and so do you. The ones, that, the ones of them that are not happy with it, they still got to fit with the culture. You can try and change your culture, but in the main, you've got to first of all, the first step in even changing your culture is to be aware of what it is right now, exactly what it is, and why it is. Okay? So, third one. Uncertainty avoidance. Those of you with Google already know what I'm going to say. Next. 